So this story, we call it the presentation of Jesus in the temple. Again, it's only in the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And so we want to explore why it's there, what the point is, and how we might learn something from it. The story is kind of interesting. Simeon and Anna, who are very old people, have now seen the Lord's Messiah, who is Jesus. They have been fulfilled, and they can now move on with their lives even to the point of death. And so Jesus comes in and he reveals something of God and there's some reason that Luke has this story of him being presented in the temple. At the end of the story, we read this, when they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. The child Jesus became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. So there are a lot of people in the world who are interested to know more about who Jesus is. And the question I have for us this morning is, which Jesus do we present to the world? Which Jesus do we present to people who are fascinated by who he is, who might want to know more about who he is? And so who is it and how is it that we present Jesus to the world. There are people who say they they want to see Jesus. They want to know about him. They want perhaps to fall in love with him. They're curious about who he is. And so the question again comes back to us, which Jesus do we present to the world? People have questions. People don't know exactly what it means to name and understand this man, Jesus. And so which Jesus do we present to the world? The Friday morning uh, book group, Coffee in Christ, is reading a wonderful book by Barbara Brown Taylor called Holy Envy. One of the really fun and interesting images that she has in that book is the idea that all of us have file folders in our spiritual lives that contain some information about Jesus. All of us do. Uh, Mine began with Sunday school, and so I have kind of a Sunday school understanding of who Jesus is. And then there was children's choir, and so singing about Jesus was another file folder as I came to understand who he was. Then there was the file folder for confirmation, and then uh, there was the file folder for summer camp, all of these different ways that I came to understand who Jesus was. And then there was the Lutheran campus ministry when I was an undergrad student at Allegheny College and more information went in there. Then there is the file folder that came out of a weekend retreat experience I had with a group of charismatic Christians and I felt bad because I couldn't speak in tongues and so there was that file folder trying to understand Jesus. And then there was seminary, a big file folder, understanding who Jesus is. And so all of these come together for all of us, kind of a composite of who we think Jesus is. And then there is 30-some years of being a pastor and all of that. The thing is, there there ought to be some kind of empty file for more room, for more discovery, for more understanding of who Jesus is. We all have our file folders. You have yours. I have mine. And they all have slightly different or dramatically different information about who Jesus is. One of the questions that I was struggling with when I talked to some of my more conservative Christian friends in college was this whole thing of John 14, 6, And even more than that, what did it mean that Jesus died on the cross? So a question I had then was, did you go to the cross because God was angry with us and so you had to die because some of my more conservative Christian friends had that file folder. This is it. This is the truth. And then I came to understand, no, God wasn't angry with us. Jesus just loved us that much. It was his mission 
to give his life for us, to heal us, to make us new, and to give us eternal, abundant life. And so the cross is about that, not about anybody who's angry, but instead somebody who is in love, deeply in love. And then there was this one, John 14, 6. Jesus, what does it mean that you were the way, the truth, and the life? Because I have friends, Jesus, who when we come to an impasse in a conversation about you, it's like a duel. We come to an impasse, and here are the pistols, John 14, 6. That ends the conversation. What does it mean that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except by you? Jesus, what, what do you mean by that? And why do some of your followers use these words as weapons and as a way of proving that they are superior to others who follow you? John 14, 6 is one of those classic passages that is used to supposedly separate the true faithful out from others. So what does it mean that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Well, the way of Jesus is the way down into the depths. The way of Jesus is out to the outer orbit where lots of people who most people think shouldn't be a part of things are. The way of Jesus is down into the depression and the illness and the struggles. That's the way of Jesus not with the pretty people, not with the religious people, not with the people who have everything together. That's the way of Jesus. What is the truth of Jesus? Truth is that, that Jesus came into this world because God so loves the world. And so the truth about Jesus is that Jesus challenges us to love in that same way, which is not inclusive, but it, has, it is as broad and exclusive as you can imagine. That is the truth of Jesus, the life of Jesus. I came that ha they might have life and have it abundantly, Jesus says in the Gospel of John. That's the gift that we are given, and again, it's a gift that is as broad or broader than we can imagine. So John 14, 6 is not about this. John 14, 6 is about this. The way, the truth, and the life of Jesus include us, just as they include everybody else. So we've got all these file folders, and I have them from my childhood and seminary and being a pastor and, and then kind of struggling over the years with, with this idea that people want to think that, that Jesus loves Americans more. Well, Jesus doesn't love Americans more, and Jesus doesn't love Americans any less. Jesus loves Americans equally. So that's not about politics. It's a global view of who Jesus cares about. We can fall, though, into the sin of nationalism. Any ism is problematic. Any ism should make us pay attention an ism like nationalism can lead us to believe that we are, in fact, the more favored people. 1994, a long time ago, there was a great movie called Schindler's List. It's a story about World War II Germany. It involves the central character, played by Liam Neeson, named Oscar Schindler. So Oscar Schindler was an entrepreneur he was a drunk, he was a womanizer, and I don't think as far as we know that he ever stepped foot in a Christian church. The story of Schindler's List is how Schindler saved roughly 1,200 Jews, and you know what Hitler wanted to happen with them, about 1,200 Jews by employing them at his munitions plant. And he was able to save their lives because of it. Meanwhile, in Germany, there were people who were saying that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, who were actually hooking up with the Nazi regime and wanting to make the church and the Nazi regime one and the same. They were proclaiming Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I'd submit to you that Oscar Schindler, the heavy drinker, the, the womanizer, the guy who never went to church, that he was living the way, the truth, and the life in a way that even he might not have understood. And so Jesus uses people who are outside of sort of respectable 
uh, churchianity and finds that they are able to be about showing and living the way, the truth, and the life beyond anything that they or we can understand. Oscar Schindler, to me, is uh, an incredible witness to the way, the truth, and the life, and he didn't probably even know it. Barbara Brown Taylor says this, No church, no church doctrine, no individuals get to referee. Where the way of Jesus is concerned, he is the decider. We don't get to decide. We would like to. I'd like to decide what you ought to be and what your eternal destiny ought to be, and maybe you'd like to do the same, but Jesus is the decider. And thank goodness for that, because the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus is far bigger than anything we could imagine or maybe even want it to be. So all of these file folders... Sunday school and confirmation and church camp and seminary and ministry and struggling with nationalism. And then, of course, there is this because this is the month of February and this is Black History Month. If for no other reason than the history of our country, we should stop for a moment and acknowledge uh, Black History Month. You go back four to five hundred years We think that our youngest daughter uh, probably has folks who were there in West Africa, imagine that, and made their way across the Middle Passage to the United States of America. Pretty amazing. We know that there were African, black Africans who jumped over the side of the ship and committed suicide rather than enduring the Middle Passage. We know that in the hull of the ship, There were hundreds of black Africans who lost their lives between the West African area all the way over to the United States. That's a symptom of America's original sin, which is racism. Jim Wallace talks about that in a book by this title, America's Original Sin. It's one of the things in one of my file folders that I've struggled with a lot over the years. It's not necessarily an easy or popular thing to talk about, but it is a part of our story. And even still, Jesus is able to include us in the way and the truth and the life. But an ism like racism has caused countless numbers of people uh, to lose their lives unjustly. Commend to you, this is a bit of an aside, uh, would commend to you a, a just out movie called Just Mercy. Uh, I think that's the title. It's not somebody can tell me, but it's an incredible story. It's a hopeful story, but it points to some of the struggles, which is why we need to lift up Black History Month. This picture uh, was in my home congregation big, big picture uh, of Jesus. Did any of you have this in in your home congregation? Yeah, yeah. Blonde hair and blue-eyed. I like that, David, because I was blonde hair and blue-eyed. Yeah, it means I'm a lot like Jesus, right? Not so much, okay. But in my file folder, I thought Jesus was white. Why not? Why not? Oh, there he was. Well, there's been some interesting uh, work that's been done around the identity of Jesus, and this isn't definitive or authoritative, but I think it's interesting anyhow, and, and there are some people who think that Jesus might have looked like this, that since he was Middle Eastern, he might have looked, well, Middle Eastern, brown hair and probably darker skin and maybe brown eyes. And I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, okay, uh, would he be met with suspicion if he were to come into our building on Sunday morning or lots of other predominantly white church buildings on Sunday morning? I think the answer is yes. I think the answer is yes, which really points back to 9-11 and the idea 
that you know, all Muslims are Middle Eastern and all Middle Eastern Muslims are terrorists when we know in fact that the majority of Muslims are Indonesian. But we have this kind of phobia and this fear. So what if Jesus were to present himself in that way? And how would we respond? And could we see in that face the savior of the world? I think it's a, it's a good thing to wrestle with a little bit and maybe to put in your file folder and say, this is one maybe I want to talk about and think about because it's important. So what Jesus does Jesus present to us at the end of the day? What Jesus does Jesus present to us? On my better days and on my more gracious days, I think, well, probably a little bit of all of those file folders that have been a part of my journey and part of the file folders that have been a part of your journey and and all of that, he's trying to help us see who he is as he presents himself to us. Maybe it's as simple as this. When, When I know somebody really loves me, when I know someone really loves me, it makes me happy to respond in love. In fact, I'm anxious and wanting to respond in love. What if the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus is is that? That when we see the cross, we see ultimate love, we see mission accomplished, we see the most amazing love ever. And when we hear that and see that love, it makes us want to respond. makes us want to say, yeah, I want to be a part of this. So in all of your file folders, if you've got an empty one, maybe put that in there and know that there's truth in that. What does Jesus present to us? I think we know. Love, and we respond, not because we have to, but because we get to. That's who he is. That's who he presents himself to us as always. That's the way, the truth, and the life.